Uh, raise your hand if you are somebody who tends to lose things or break things. Show hands. Be honest. All right. Okay. Uh, feel free to raise the hand of the person sitting next to you if they're not being honest. Um, <laughs> I see that. I see that hand. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever lost or broken something uh, important or valuable. Keep, okay, keep your hands up. All right. I, I want to hear. Can, can you be honest? Can I shout out. What have you lost or broken? Something valuable. A ring? An engagement ring. Okay, awesome. Uh, we'll give you the link to our counseling line after this. Uh, uh, what else? Shout out. Wedding ring. We another wedding ring? Okay. We've got some w uh, interesting stories in this room. Okay, uh, over here, yeah? Your wife's antiques. Plural. She's still mad. How, how many years ago was that? A couple weeks ago. You said, till death do us part. Uh, just remember that. Okay. One more. Uh, something valuable, lost, or broken? A Chinese pot. A Chinese pot? Okay. All right. So we got some like antique collectibles in this room and then some people who just can't hold on to their wedding ring, apparently. Uh, that's great. Um, I am somebody who has a long track record of losing things that are broken or valuable. Uh, one of the earliest ones I can remember was in fifth grade. Uh, the love of my life uh, at the time, her name was Alicia. Uh, gave me a bracelet. And uh, she had gone to Mexico with her family, come back with this bracelet and said, I spent all of my allowance money on this for you. And I took it. I would worn it for no more than a week. And I was at a park playing. And I, at the end of the day, I got to get in the car and it was gone. And so I enlisted my whole family to go out and look for it for about an hour and a half to no avail. And I had to go back and tell Alicia, I lost the bracelet that you spent all your allowance on, money on for me. And uh, she was in fifth grade, so she didn't have the words to say it at the time, uh, but her eyes said, uh, if I can't trust you with a bracelet, how can I ever trust you with my heart? Um, <laughs> and so that was the beginning of the end of that relationship. Um, when I was 10 or 12, my dad took me out uh, to a driving range, like golf. I was a baseball player, but I hadn't been to a driving range. He's like, let's, let's introduce you to this. And so uh, uh, he gave me a wood, like a driving wood. I don't know if you know this, but a baseball swing is not good for a golf swing. And so uh, very first swing, I drive the wood so hard into the turf that the head just snaps off. And my dad is just rolling laughing. He's like, I've never seen that happen in real life. And so he's like, don't worry about it. Uh, he, that was my, you know, cruddy club. Here's a, a real club. Uh, and the next swing, I did the exact same thing uh, with his new nice club. And he thought that was less funny than the first time, for sure. Uh, right around the same time, I learned how to start uh, catching things on fire with a magnifying glass. So I spent an entire summer doing that. And uh, uh, caught my house on fire. So... Uh, that's another story for another time. Uh, and this didn't get better as time went on. On my honeymoon, um, my wife were out, and I were out in central Oregon, and I knew I wanted to do some fishing. I'm not a great fisher, but my dad, again, faithful dad, lent me his uh, fishing rod as we went off on a lazy river to go fishing. And the first cast, uh, instead of casting the line out into the water, I just threw the whole rod out into <laughs> this lazy river, which sounds like a crazy thing. Um, and my wife reminds me of that. Uh, once a week, uh, I would say, uh, is what she reminds me of. She, I asked her, I said, can you give me any more stories of, of this this week? And she texted me and she goes, how about you just tell people you leave your credit card places like it's your business card? Uh, and I, I said, thanks for the vote of confidence there, babe. Um, here's why I detail that out. Um, I would say that uh, we, as Christians, we believe that the gospel is that we've been given something incredible. Amen. Uh, we have an inheritance of infinite value. And so the question that many of us have wrestled with, maybe you've wrestled with this, maybe you're going through it right now, is, uh, is my salvation just another gift that I have the potential to lose or break? Uh, it, it is understandable with eternity on the line. This is big stakes stuff. Wondering, can I fall from grace? What if I train wreck my faith? Can I lose my salvation? That's what we're going to wrestle with today. Uh, we are in the final week of a seven-week series out of the letter of 1 John. And the author of 1 John is likely the Apostle John, if you haven't been around. Uh, one of Jesus' inner circle, along with Peter and James. And John also was the author of the Gospel of John, one of the four biographies of the life of Jesus we have in our New Testament. As well as the very end of the uh, Bible, the book of Revelation. And the sort of through line of the letter of 1 John is this, that an inward connection to God, if we actually belong to God, there should be outward evidence of that connection, that our lives should be living proof 
that we belong to this one true God. And uh, we are in the very last section of John's letter. This is how he finishes his letter. So what does he say with his final words? We'll pick it up at verse 11. It says, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So John's speaking of this testimony, something he's testifying to, and it's the gospel. It's the story that he encountered that he is trying to get out into the world. And this whole story, he says, can be summarized in essentially two sentences. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So for John, having true life is binary. Either you have it or you don't. There is no gray area. And the difference between the one who has life and the one who doesn't, according to John, is whether or not they have the Son, which of course is Jesus. Now, you might be hearing this and thinking, okay, uh, I'm not a Christian sitting here listening to this. Maybe I got drugged to church, whatever. Uh, But I'm living my life independently of Jesus. He really doesn't have a say in what I do or how I think. And I seem to be doing quite fine. I'm not sure that I buy into this idea that in order to truly have life, I need Jesus. Now, if that's you today, I just want to say, first of all, glad you're here. Second of all, that I am very familiar with that sort of line of thinking. Most of my life growing up, I did not go to church, did not believe in Jesus, didn't even own a Bible, and thought I was just fine on my own. Uh, So if, if that's you, I get it. I was an atheist, and it wasn't until late high school until I came to faith. But if that's your place, and that's your objection here today, here's what I'd say. Uh, Earlier this year, I got a new iPhone. Uh, My old one, I kind of try to run these out as long as I can, and it started breaking down on me, so I said, okay, I'm going to bite the bullet, go to the store, and get a new iPhone. And so they give me this new iPhone in a box, and I don't know if you've ever opened an iPhone uh, out of a box, uh, it is an experience. Uh, like, you open it up, and you're like, I'm going to keep this box forever. Um, and, and then there's like, that you peel back that glorious sticker, you know, and it makes it sound. And, uh, uh, and so uh, then you hold this black brick in your hand, and you can power it on, and it just comes to life. And within a few minutes, you can be using it right away. Apple has just perfected this process. But in the bottom of the box, there is an accessory. And what is it? It's a charger. It is the same thing that has been coming with the iPhone ever since it was released in 2007. Now, why does this come with the with the iPhone? There we go. We got some smart people in the room. All right. Um, As much as Apple has been able to innovate, as much technology as they can cram into this tiny black square that we can hold in our hand and connects us to the world, the one thing that Apple cannot give us is a phone that operates independently of a power source. The great lie, friends, that you and I tend to believe is that we can operate on our own, that we actually don't need God in our lives. But the truth is we are contingent creatures. To assume that our life is going just fine without God and therefore to disregard him is a bit like opening up the iPhone box and seeing that it turns on and it's working just fine and taking the power cord and getting rid of it. The reality is things may go fine for a little while. That is true. But eventually, that illusion of independence will soon fall apart because just like an iPhone, you and I need an external power source if we're going to make it. And John doesn't mince words. Here he says there are two types of humans, those who have the sun and those who do not. One has life and one doesn't. And if that feels a little little jarring, that is actually what John intends. If that feels a little confrontational, John would say, that's exactly my point. Just like a doctor who sees a patient making harmful life decisions and urging change, John is coming along and saying, get off the path that leads to death and cling to the one who rescues and saves. Cling to Jesus. So he does not want to comfort those who are operating independently of Jesus. He actually wants to put a rock in their shoe. But then there are those who do have the Son, those who have recognized that independence from God is actually an act of rebellion, and that if we are to have any hope of true life, then we need to come back to him and cling to his mercy that he's extended us. And to those who have made that decision, John has a very different message. His message is this, you have eternal life. And if that's you today, I want you to hear this. This is Pastor John putting his hand on your shoulder and looking you in the eyes and saying, you're going to be okay. If you have Jesus, you are secure. You don't need to worry. A few verses later, John says this, the one who is born of God, he's talking about Jesus, keeps them, that's us who belong to Jesus, what? 
safe, safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. Now, I don't want to rush past this because I know that some of you need to hear this today, maybe for the first time or maybe just as a timely reminder based on whatever it is that you're going through. If you belong to Jesus, your salvation is not like any other valuable thing that you are at risk of losing or breaking. This is what John is saying. If you are saved, you are safe. Now, to be clear, we still live in a fallen world. Some of us know this very viscerally right now in the season that we're going through. We are still prone to all of the things that come with living in a fallen world. Prone to sickness, prone to uh, natural disasters and the effects that they have, prone to relational fracturing. All of these things come with the world we live in. But by safe, here's what I mean. I mean that your salvation is ultimately safe in God's hands. If you have trusted in Jesus, you don't need to lose any sleep over your future. Uh, one of my faith heroes, Tim Keller, uh, once had an illustration that he told uh, along these lines. Uh, raise your hand if you really do not like flying on planes. Not your cup of tea, whether it's something that makes you uncomfortable or terrifies you. Okay. Now raise your hand, hands down. Raise your hand if uh, riding on a plane really doesn't phase you all that much. You're quite comfortable with it. Okay. <clears throat> hands down. Question. Out of those two groups, which group is safer on an airplane? The, yeah, the same. Now, why are both groups equally safe on a plane? Because your safety on an airplane does not rest on how confident or nervous you are. It rests on the skill of the one who is flying the plane, the pilot. So you may have heard people debate over this question, can I lose my salvation? And, and here's what I'd say. Uh, can I lose my salvation is actually the wrong question. John is reframing the question to be this. Can God lose your salvation? And to that, he gives a resounding no. No, he cannot. Your salvation, friends, is kept not by, God's, not by your own faithfulness, but by God's faithfulness. It is not kept by your own power. It is kept by God's power. John is reframing the gospel uh, 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 in the good news of salvation out of the realm of what you might call legalism or rule following and into the realm of grace. Here's another way of putting it. Legalism says that God keeps his end of the bargain. The gospel says he keeps our end too. That's the scandal of grace. That is so different than any other religion that the world has to offer. This is the whole point of Jesus stepping down out of heaven, putting on flesh, living the life that we should have lived, and dying on the cross on our behalf. He is our human substitute, keeping our end of the bargain when we couldn't ourselves. That is the gospel. So hear this clearly today. If you have trusted in Jesus, friend, you are secure. If you are in Christ, you are safe. Verse 13. John says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So here John includes kind of like a purpose statement for this final section of his letter. He's writing, so that you who believe in the Son of God may know that you have eternal life. Uh, that word know occurs seven times in the short little passage that we're looking at together and 38 times in John's five chapter letter, 38 times. It's a sort of refrain that he uses. So he says things like, we know the truth. We know it's the last hour. We know what it's gonna be like when Christ appears again. And here John says, the reason that he is writing to us who believe in the name of Jesus in this final section of the letter, why he's penning these words is so that we may know that we have, not will have, but presently have, eternal life. So why is he saying this? Why is he so adamant to spend his final words reassuring us along these lines? Because John knows that what we believe determines how we behave. Uh, I heard a story recently uh, that illustrates this really well. It's about a Japanese soldier in World War II. Here it is. Hiro Onoda was an intelligence officer in the Japanese Imperial, Imperial Army, stationed on the island of Lubang in the Philippines during World War II. When Japan surrendered in 1945, Onoda and a few other soldiers who were hiding in the jungle never received news that the war, war was over. So even as the war ended, Onoda continued to believe that it was still ongoing. The Japanese government and various people tried multiple times to inform him that he could come home by dropping leaflets, sending search parties, and broadcasting messages, but Onoda dismissed all of it as enemy propaganda. For years, Anoda lived in the jungle, surviving off the land, and continued to engage in small gunfights, thinking he was still fighting for his country. He believed that as a soldier, he was duty-bound to follow his last orders, which were to keep fighting at all costs. 
Officials in the Japanese government eventually realized that Inoda would only believe that the war was over if the news was personally delivered by the man who had been his commanding officer, Major Yoshimi Taniguchi. So they located Taniguchi, who had since become a bookseller, and flew him to the Philippines where Inoda was hiding, and Taniguchi gave Inoda the orders to stand down. So on March 10th, 1974, Inoda laid down his rifle, left hiding, and returned to civilian life. In the end, Inoda had held out for 28 years, six months, and eight days, living in a self-imposed captivity, bound by a war that had long since ended. What we believe determines how we behave. And John wants us to know, know that we are safe because knowing that actually changes the way that we live. To put it simply, when you are safe, you can walk in confidence. Jesus brings good news, friends. His final words before dying on the cross, it is finished. And those are three words that Hiro Onoda did not hear. Not knowing that the war was over caused him to live in fear and hiding for almost 30 years in a jungle. And John says, I don't want you to have to live like that. He commits himself to teaching what we can know to be true because he wants us to walk not in fear, not in hiding, but in confidence. And I just want to, my hope is today that some of you hear this and you like can, can peel back the layer of fear and anxiety that you may be living in. Like, how does God see me? Does he indeed love me? Am I going to be okay in the end? And my hope is that you would walk in a renewed, fresh confidence, knowing that you are safe in God's hands. And he wants you to live a life marked not by fear, but by abundance and confidence. John continues in verse 14. He says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. So, so far, John has taught us what? If you are saved, you are safe. When you know you are safe, you can walk in confidence. And here he's saying this. When you are confident, you can pray with power. You can pray with power. Uh, every single day when I come home, my boys uh, come running to find me, uh, which is fantastic. Sometimes it gets a little hairy. They like don't even wait for the car to stop before they start tugging on the door handle. We're working on that. Don't worry. Um, but then they open the door, and the very first thing out of their mouth is, is not, I love you. Uh, it's not, certainly not, uh, how has your day been, Dad? Uh, it is almost always to ask me for something. Some of you can relate to this, okay? Uh, so for my nine-year-old Keller, he's my oldest. Uh, him, it is usually, Dad, I want you to see my latest Lego creation, because he's doing those all the time, uh, or to show me one of our chickens. Okay, so he loves our chickens, so we have a picture here. Uh, this is Keller with our, two of our chickens. Uh, we have nine of them. They are his babies, and uh, he's you named them each a unique Star Wars chicken pun, which is, find me afterwards, I'll tell you their names. Uh, then we've got Jojo. Okay, Jojo's my youngest. He's three years old, and he comes, and he always wants to either uh, race or wrestle. Now, I don't know how y'all do wrestling in your house. In my house, it gets kind of crazy, okay? Uh, this is like an average Tuesday at 5.15 p.m. Uh, there's like the dog involved, okay? Uh, my wife, by the way, is never involved. This is her foot. Uh, that's why you can see that. Uh, can we punch in here? I just want you to notice here, uh, one of us is having fun. Um, <laughs> one of us. Like, he's got his, like, digging into my, some of you think I'm bald because of genetics. I shaved, so he has one less thing to grab onto, okay? <laughs> like, it's, he will not hesitate to ask me, no matter the time of day, no matter what's going on, will you race me or will you wrestle me? And here's my point. My boys are so confident to ask me for anything that they want because they know that I am a safe presence for them. They know that I love them, I give them good things all the time, and so they ask for things all the time. Uh, and being told no, it does not phase them. I, they will either move on to the next thing or they'll, they'll like just reframe the question using different words, thinking that I'm, uh, I don't know, as smart as them. Uh, <laughs> their safety makes them confident to ask me for anything they can think of. Sometimes these are big things and tenacious things. Sometimes these are things that push the bounds of what is possible or legal, uh, and I hear all of it, right? They ask with boldness and audacity. They aren't afraid to ask their dad for things. Here's my point. My boys teach me how I think God wants me to come to him in prayer. Look again at these verses. John says, if we ask anything, and whatever we ask, 
will have it. With one caveat. He says, if we ask according to his will. So we are not promised that we will get anything and everything that we ask for. I want to be really clear about that, right? Just like any good parent, God knows when to say no, especially when it's to our detriment, okay? If we got that thing. But we are promised that he loves to give graciously and generously when we are aligned with his will. So here's the question for you today. Do you know the kinds of things that are according to God's will? Like not mysterious things, but like everyday things. Do you know how God desires for us to live? And are you asking along those lines? Uh, Because my boys ask for things all the time, um, I find myself saying no a lot. Some of you parents know what this is like. Uh, But here's the thing. These days, I actually find myself saying yes a lot more. Uh, Not always because I'm getting worn down, although sometimes it is because of that. Okay, fine, you can have it. Uh, But as my boys get older, they actually learn the kinds of things that I am more likely to say yes to, and they know the kinds of things they'll never get, and so they ask more precisely, knowing what I love to give them. So are you today maturing in your faith? Are you getting to know God better along those same lines? This is where good theology matters really practically. Here's how I would say it. Good theology helps us to know what God loves to say yes to and therefore to know how to pray. Now, to be clear, uh, God does not bless sin or stupidity, right? Can we just get that out of the way? Like, some of you know this personally. You're like, I, if God would have given me what I asked for, that would not have gone well, you know? And God is like, yep, I knew that all along. So you, you didn't get it, right? He is a good parent. But here's the deal. If it's not sinful or stupid, it just might be something that God is waiting to give you, and you won't know until you ask for it. James, the brother of Jesus, writes in his letter in the New Testament, many of us have things in our life that we are going without, not because God isn't willing to give them, but because we have not asked him for those things. And so our job is to get to know God's character and to boldly and audaciously ask him as our heavenly father. Ask him, and then just step back and see what happens. Who knows? Now, before we move on to the final part of our passage, John does give us one very specific kind of prayer that he says God delights in giving yes answers to this kind of prayer. It's a helpful thing to know, okay? So what is it? Verse 16. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. If there's a sin that leads to death, I'm not saying you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is a sin that does not lead to death. So cards on the table, this is a little bit of a weird one, okay? Uh, John seems to be saying some strange things about sin and how to pray and not pray for people, but if you kind of take a closer look, some things get clearer, okay? So first, John is saying if you see a brother or sister committing a sin. So the language of brother or sister is internal family language. He's talking about other followers of Jesus. He's describing situations in which other Christians are committing a sin. And he's describing a sin that does not lead to death. Then he describes a different category of sin. And he's actually not tying it to Christians, if you look carefully. He's describing a sin that some people commit that does lead to death. Now, there are some Christian traditions that uh, say there are essentially uh, different kinds of sins on a gradation, and some are big sins with a big negative point value, mortal sins. And then there are other like peccadillo little sins, you know, where they're, they're really not that bad, less points taken off of your record. And so we kind of have to look at each sin and what it'll cost us. And, and I would say that is not actually the New Testament vision for sin. Throughout the New Testament, including right here in John's letter, there are essentially two types of sin. There are sins that get forgiven and those that don't. It's that simple. John says all wrongdoing is sin. And then he talks about a sin that leads to death. And when he talks about that kind of sin, we have every indication that he is talking about the kind of sin that is denying Jesus in the first place and refusing the offer of forgiveness that Jesus extends. That is the only sin. That is the only sin that is a non-starter for forgiveness. Every other sin is eligible for forgiveness if we turn to Jesus, the one who offers forgiveness and trust in his finished work for us. So what John is encouraging us to do in light of that is to pray for each other, other believers, when we see somebody caught up in sin. Uh, Many of us, my guess is right here, right now, can call to mind somebody in your life who's entangled in sin. Like, you know a name. And maybe it's been, like, weighing on you. My question is, are you just sitting in frustration 
with that person? Are you just sitting in anger or sadness? Or are you doing something about it? It is a good and right thing to talk to that person about their sin, especially if they don't realize they're entangled in it. But here's my question. Are you talking to God on behalf of that person? Maybe a question that you need to wrestle with this uh, is today. Who is testing your patience, but not your prayers? Who are you complaining about, but not praying for? This kind of talking to God on behalf of others is called intercessory prayer. It's simply interceding on others' behalf, asking that God would move and bring healing and restoration. And right here, John, friends, he says God loves to answer those kinds of prayers with a yes. I love what Richard Foster says. He says, if we truly love people, we will desire far more for them than it is within our power to give them. And that will drive us to prayer. Intercessory prayer is a way of loving the people around us. So if you're a follower of Jesus, remember this. The God of the universe is listening to you. And when you pray, his power is in many senses at your disposal. When you are confident in who you are in Christ, you can pray with power. Now, for the final section in John's letter, here's what he says. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who is born of God, again, talking about Jesus, keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. So there's a tension here. If you sense it, in some sense he's saying, if you're in Christ, God keeps you safe. The evil one cannot harm you. And on the other hand, he's saying, if you're in Christ, you will not continue to sin. Now, what does John obviously not mean? He obviously doesn't mean that for Christians it's impossible to sin, Okay. Uh, If you need to remind the person to your left uh, of that right now, feel free to take the opportunity to to go ahead and do that, okay? So what is John saying? That word continuing to sin is a Greek word, and that carries the notion of sinning as an ongoing, unrepentant lifestyle. You're making a lifestyle choice of that thing. John says, it's the whole point of our series, that we are to be living proof that God has made us new. It's such a powerful transformation that John right here calls it being born of God. In the Gospel of John, he records Jesus saying, anyone who wants to see the kingdom of God must be born again, which is where we get our phrase, born again Christian. For the Christian, the promise that your salvation is secure, hear this, is not and should never be a license to go sin and think you're just going to get away with it. The fruit or evidence that you belong to Jesus is that you actually begin to look like him. We here at The Bridge take this so seriously that it's part of our mission statement. We say that you should be with Jesus and become like him for the sake of the world. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have bad days. A bad day should never make you question your salvation. Uh, I've heard Ian talk about a mentor encouraging him to measure spiritual progress, not in terms of minutes or hours, but in terms of months and years. You see, we're talking trajectory language. As you look at the trajectory of your life, are you over the course of months and years becoming more and more like the Jesus who saved you? John says this in verse 19. We know that we are children of God and that the whole, whole world is under the control of the evil one. We also know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. So that phrase, uh, the whole world is under the control of the evil one, may feel a little strange, okay? Uh, If you were to ask the average Christian, uh, whose control is the world under? You're probably going to hear God. But this is not the only place in the New Testament where this occurs. So Paul describes Satan as the prince of the power of the air. Jesus himself refers to Satan as the ruler of this age. And so here's want to be really clear. This is what John is doing. He is acknowledging that even though that Jesus is still in control, Satan is still running about causing trouble. Even though the victory is won, it's sort of the difference between uh, DE Day and V Day, you know, if you know World War II. It is that gap where the war is declared won, but there are still skirmishes happening as Satan is using whatever power is still left up to him. And he's saying that Jesus is returning where all of that will be undone. And if we know that, we can be prepared for Satan's attack and be prepared to guard against it with the hope of our eyes fixed on the fact that Jesus will come again and usher in an age where everything sad will become untrue. And he will usher in a kingdom that will never again be co-opted or corrupted. Every tear wiped away. The world as it should be. And with that in mind, John finishes his letter with one last sentence. Here's what he says. Dear children, 
Keep yourselves from idols. Now that may seem like a weird way to end a letter, kind of like a throwaway line, but here's what I'd say. It's actually a very short summary of what John has been saying all along. John has just gotten done reminding us over and over that the king of the universe has adopted us, he's brought us into the riches of his grace, and he's promised that nothing can take away what is most true about us. We're safe. And so his final plea is this. If all of that is true, listeners, children of God, stop going back to dry wells. Stop going back to the things of the old way of life. Some of those things, you know what those are for you. Stop chasing life in places where you know it cannot deliver the life that you're looking for and the life you've already encountered in Christ. Stop chasing it. Maybe you need to hear it this way. If you are a child of the king, stop clutching onto fool's gold. There's a reason that we begin each service with a posture of open hands. We enter this space and say, God, I don't want to live with counterfeits in my hands. So I'm going to open into the, come into this space and I'm going to say, God, anything that I'm holding on to that's holding me back from the abundant life that you have waiting for me, I'm willing to let that go. Just say the word. And God, while my hands are open, I am ready to receive whatever it is for, that you have for me, even if it's a hard thing, because I trust you. You are good. My hands are open. This is a posture we around here call surrender. Surrender. It is the courageously vulnerable act of yielding our desires, our plans, our whole life to Jesus and letting him be what he is, which is king. And if you've never done that, if you've never had this posture of surrender, but you're kind of taking some inventory and you feel the spirit is doing something in you right now, you're like, I think I do need to yield and let go of this life I've been living and turn to Jesus, receive this forgiveness, receive the safe future that he has ready for me. Then I'll say this, mark this moment. Don't let it go by. You can go right now to bridge.tv slash surrender. And it's just a way to start a conversation with us. There's a button at the top that just says, send us a message. And you get to just say, today's my surrender day. And I want to talk to somebody about it. And we will come alongside you and celebrate with you and rejoice with you and walk alongside you as you take next steps in this new journey. But I'll say this, whatever it is that you have been clinging on to, that you know is over-promising and under-delivering, you can let it go. And with open hands, you can say, Jesus, the one who is true and offers true life, fill my hands with whatever it is that you have for me so that I might step into the abundant life that is waiting on the other side. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us on our YouTube channel today. I hope that you felt the welcome home of Christ right through your screen. Here we believe that the gospel is good news worth sharing. So if you'd like to share this stream with your friends and family, you can also subscribe to this channel and you can use at BridgeChurchTN. Also, if you'd like to give, there's a link in the description there. You can click and it'll walk you through all the steps. And if you'd like to stay connected with us, you can simply head on over to bridge.tv. Hope to see you again soon.